This is going to be a brief, a brief video on respiratory failure, hopefully a review of things you've learned previously in medical school. Within this video, we're going to do a couple things. First, we're going to define the three types of respiratory failure and be able to recognize respiratory failure, list the mechanisms of hypercapnia, explain how dead space causes hypercapnia, list the mechanisms of hypoxemia, and then within a classical clinical scenario, identify the underlying mechanism of either hypercapnia or hypoxemia. So, what are the types of respiratory failure? I think there are three types of respiratory failure. There is hypercarbic respiratory failure, hypoxemic respiratory failure, and then a mixture of both hypercarbic and hypoxemic respiratory failure. A question I'm often asked is, well, how do you know when a patient has respiratory failure? I often think back to the classic 1964 Supreme Court case about obscenity and pornography. In the majority decision written by Justice Potter Stewart, he redefined obscenity as, I know it when I see it. And the same is true for respiratory failure. Over time, you know it when you see it. Clearly, there are things to look for. With hypercarbic respiratory failure, these patients often have profound increased work of breathing, and it requires some sort of mechanical intervention to improve that, whether it's BiPAP or CPAP or intubation. They often have an elevated CO2, but I'm not talking about a CO2 of 45 or 47. I'm talking about a higher CO2 than that, and it again needs mechanical intervention in order to improve. With regards to hypoxemic respiratory failure, these patients are profoundly hypoxemic. Their oxygen saturations are less than 90%, and it requires more than just a little bit of nasal cannula to improve their oxygenation. It is definitely true that some patients just have hypercarbic respiratory failure, and some patients just have hypoxemic respiratory failure. But most patients have a mixture of both. Without mechanical intervention, they have inability to ventilate or inability to oxygenate. Let's go more in depth into hypercarbic respiratory failure. Before we do that, we have to talk about a basic foundational concept, that of minute ventilation. Minute ventilation is equal to respiratory rate times your tidal volume. And again, let's go more in depth into tidal volume. Tidal volume is combined of two different types of tidal volume. There's dead space volume, and there's the alveolar volume. Dead space volume is normal. We call this anatomic dead space. This occurs where the lungs ventilate, but they don't perfuse. Classic places for this are in the trachea and the large bronchi. Where ventilation and oxidation actually occurs is in the alveolar volume, at the alveolar capillary unit. Here, the alveoli have oxygen and get transmitted across the epithelial cells into the capillaries. And within the capillaries, CO2 is diffused across the epithelial cells back into the alveoli and then out into the air. Again, dead space occurs normally in all of us where the lungs ventilate but don't perfuse. Let's move on to the causes of hypercapnia. Hypercapnia can be caused by two broad categories, a decreased removal of CO2 or an increased production of CO2. Within the decreased removal of CO2, the most common one is just a decreased minute ventilation overall. The patient won't breathe or can't breathe. But another time you have decreased removal of CO2 is when you have increased dead space beyond that normal anatomic dead space. Now remember, if total ventilation is equal to alveolar ventilation plus dead space ventilation, and let's say that total ventilation stays exactly the same, but dead space ventilation goes up, you know what has to happen with alveolar ventilation? It has to go down. Now this happens in two classic pathological conditions. One is COPD and the other is asthma. That's why these patients have trouble ventilating and often live with higher CO2s, at least when it comes to COPD. Now, increased production of CO2 is interesting because it's only a problem if minute ventilation doesn't match the rise in PCO2. Well, what causes increased production of CO2? Things like fever cause it, sepsis, exercise, overfeeding, and most of the time when we have fever, we breathe faster. Most of the time when we have sepsis, we breathe faster to get rid of our CO2. But let's say you have a another respiratory illness on top of your fever or sepsis, and you try to breathe faster, but you just can't. Again, it's that can't breathe mechanism, and combined, you can have profound hypercapnia. I just want to predict the changes in PCO2 based on changes in respiratory rate and tidal volume using a case. Now, how would your PCO2 change in a patient after being injected with 10 times the normal dose of morphine? Let's go back to that foundational concept of minute ventilation. Minute ventilation is equal to respiratory rate 
times tidal volume. And that tidal volume is both, again, the dead space volume and the alveolar volume. Well, we know that morphine decreases the body's interest in breathing. Your tidal volumes are just more shallow. It also decreases your respiratory rate. So together, it decreases your ventilation and increases your PCO2. So we've talked about causes of hypercapnia and the mechanism that dead, how dead space increases hypercapnia. Now let's move on to the mechanisms of hypoxemia. Let's use a case to do this. You have a patient who's been on four liters nasal cannula for three hours. Her oxygen saturations have been above 95% the entire time. You are now called for a drop in her O2 saturations. Here are her vital signs. My question for you is, what's the cause of her hypoxemia? You can see her oxygen saturations are 82%. Is it low barometric pressure, hypoventilation, VQ mismatch, shunt, or diffusion abnormality? These are the five classic causes of hypoxemia. And they can be differentiated between each other by looking at two things. One is the alveolar arterial gradient, and the other is whether the hypoxemia responds to oxygen. Let's start with low barometric pressure. Now remember, in low barometric pressure, the actual container, the size of the alveoli, is just smaller. And because it's smaller, it has less room for the partial pressure of oxygen. So the problem isn't at the alveolar capillary interface. It's actually a problem at the size of the alveoli. But it does respond to oxygen, and that's because you can increase the partial pressure of oxygen by placing a patient on oxygen because you're increasing the fraction of inspired oxygen. Let's think about hypoventilation. Again, there's no alveolar arterial gradient. And this is because the problem, again, is in the alveoli, not in the transmission across the alveolar capillary unit. In hypoventilation, the problem is, is that the CO2 is really, really high in the alveoli. And because the CO2 is really, really high, there is less room for oxygen. But again, if you place the patient on oxygen, the patient will improve because you're changing the fraction of inspired oxygen. There's less nitrogen and more oxygen, therefore it increases the partial pressure of oxygen in the alveoli. The third cause of hypoxemia is VQ mismatch, and this is by far the most common cause of hypoxemia that we see in the ICU. We'll have a whole other video talking about VQ mismatch. But in brief, the problem with VQ mismatch is at the alveolar capillary unit. And what occurs is you have mud, more blood flow crossing the unit, then you have ventilation. And because of this, the blood enters the alveolar capillary unit, hypoxemic, and leaves the alveolar capillary unit, still hypoxemic. But it will respond to oxygen because if you increase the fraction of inspired oxygen, you will therefore increase the partial pressure of oxygen in the alveoli, and this large amount of oxygen in the alveoli will be able to compensate for the inadequate ventilation. Again, VQ mismatch occurs when you have more blood flow than when you have ventilation, and this causes hypoxemia. The fourth cause is shunt, which I think is an extreme version of VQ mismatch. What happens here is you have blood flow, but you have no ventilation at all. The classic form of shunt that we see in pediatrics is in congenital heart disease when there's a hole in the heart. Blood flow enters the right side of the heart, crosses across the septum into the left side of the heart and completely bypasses the lung. This is a pure shunt. No matter how much oxygen you place in those lungs, the blood's never going to see it. And that's why you have this huge AA gradient. And this is also why it doesn't respond to oxygen, because again, you can hyperoxygenate the lungs all you want. But since the blood is bypassing the lungs altogether, you don't see a response. Now, congenital heart disease is a classic example of shunt, but you also have shunt in respiratory disease as well. And this occurs when you're trying to give a patient a ton of oxygen, and they just don't seem to be getting better. That's shunt. The fifth cause of hypoxemia is diffusion abnormality, and it actually looks quite a bit like VQ mismatch. There's an AA gradient, and it responds to oxygen. The problem here isn't a discrepancy between ventilation and perfusion, but it's a problem actually at the alveolar capillary unit, where one of the linings, either the alveolar lining or the capillary lining, is too thick. And because of this, diffusion across the membrane is decreased. Now you can improve that diffusion by increasing the gradient by giving more oxygen.
So the five causes of hypoxemia, low barometric pressure, hypoventilation, VQ mismatch, shunt, and diffusion abnormality. This is incredibly complex, but I think it's worthwhile knowing the five causes and knowing that VQ mismatch is the most common, but also hypoventilation is your CO2 increases. It can also cause hypoxemia. Let's go back to the case. Again, this is a patient who was on four liters of oxygen and she was saturating 95%. And then all of a sudden, her oxygen saturations dropped. Now, what is the cause of hypoxemia? One of the best ways to know what the cause of hypoxemia is, is to get a blood gas. Here's a blood gas. You can see that her P little a O2, or the arterial oxygen partial pressure is 58, and her oxygen saturations are 82%. The other thing you need to do to identify the cause of hypoxemia is to calculate the alveolar gas partial pressure. And in order to do this, you need to know how much fraction of inspired oxygen occurs when you have four liters of nasal cannula. It's about 0.36. And just a reminder, here are the five causes of hypoxemia. So let's calculate the alveolar gas equation and then calculate the AA gradient. Hopefully this is review. Now here's the alveolar gas equation. And on the side, you can see a mock-up of an alveoli. And within here, you know the partial pressure is 760. That's the size of the unit. 47 is the partial pressure of water, which is a convention. And then the partial pressure of CO2 in the alveoli is actually calculated using the partial pressure of CO2 in the arterial. And we need that fudge factor of R. So 60, which is the partial pressure of CO2 in the artery, is divided by 0.8 and you get 75. Let's take these numbers and apply them to the alveolar gas equation. We know the fraction of inspired oxygen is 0.36. I gave that to you in the previous slide. We know the, partial or the total pressure of atmosphere is 760. Again, the total pressure of the unit of the alveoli, minus 47, minus 75. Now let's do some math to calculate the partial pressure of oxygen in the alveoli. So you get 256 when you take 0.36 times 760 minus 47. You get 256, and then we just subtract it from the partial pressure of CO2 in the alveoli. So 256 minus 75 is equal to 181 millimeters of mercury. That's the actual partial pressure of oxygen in the alveoli. Now we have to do the AA gradient, which is simply taking 181 and subtracting it from the partial pressure of oxygen in the artery, or 58, and we get 123. Now this is a huge AA gradient. Any AA gradient greater than 20 should raise a red flag and say there's something amiss here. It's not normal. So now let's go back to the causes of hypoxemia. Since we know there's an AA gradient, we can take off low barometric pressure and we can take off hypoventilation as causes or at least the primary cause of the hypoxemia, but it still could be VQ mismatch, shunt, and diffusion abnormality. The only way to know if it's VQ mismatch versus shunt is to place the patient on more oxygen and see if there's a response. So how do we do that? Let's assume the patient is placed on 100% oxygen, and then we look at their oxygen saturations in another blood gas. After the patient is put on 100% oxygen, the saturations go up to 92%, and the PaO2 goes up to 110. Because of this, we know, therefore, it's not shunt because the patient responds to oxygen. And it's either VQ mismatch or diffusion abnormality. And here you have to either do more tests, which we don't normally do, or just look at the clinical scenario. And again, most of the time, the problem is VQ mismatch. Let's review the learning objectives and make sure you've got everything under control. We wanted to define the three types of respiratory failure and recognize respiratory failure within classic clinical scenarios. We wanted to be able to list the mechanism of hypercapnia, talk about how dead space causes hypercapnia, list the mechanisms of hypoxemia, and then finally, within again classic clinical scenarios, identify the underlying mechanism of hypoxemia. Thanks for your time. Please give me feedback.